So I was watching this uh, this program on Netflix. It's this French guy of all, a very like a Parisian French guy, who travels all over the world and tries to catch these uh, these big giant fish. And if you were wondering who it is that actually watches these fish catching shows, then you're looking at him right here. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so I just found this guy kind of interesting. Um, and in one particular episode I was watching, he was down in the Everglades and he was trying to catch a bull shark from a kayak. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a bad seems like a bad idea if you ask me, but you know, this is this is what he was doing. Anyway, so his what I was interested in though uh, in this particular episode is as he was going out there, they revealed that his local guide was a little bit more notorious than most. Uh, he was a fisherman, okay, a commercial fisherman, but he turned uh, into a drug runner in the 1970s and there was like a famous huge bus um, where they 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 uh, seized almost all the boats in the Everglades uh, got, uh, for drug running so thousands of pounds of marijuana I think it was in the 70s so the way this guy told it he was fishing one day and a man came up to him and asked him for his boat and this uh, this fisherman said he needed it to make a living uh, and he said that don't worry you're gonna make more than a living and uh, soon after the fisherman started running drugs through the Everglades and he was earning about fifty to sixty thousand dollars every night that he did that until of course he was caught and he spent eleven years in prison for in federal prison this man lost a decade of his life because he decided to break the law in that way you may ask yourself, well, what, what causes people to, to decide to turn to a life of crime, to be an honest fisherman and become a drug runner? Well, you say, well, obviously it's because the money, right? Fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. And that's that's obvious, that's the surface answer. But there's a deeper underlying issue there, isn't there? There is a giving in to something that's carnal, that's fleshly that's that's evil is giving into the desire of the flesh it's submitting and worshiping the altar of greed right it says in um, 1st Timothy 6 9 and 10 it says but to those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing have it, uh, longing for it, have wandered away from the faith, and pierced themselves with many griefs. And I was thinking about this passage when I was listening to this guy's story, and I was thinking a little bit about the irony, because you can't escape irony sometimes, right? A fisherman was used to laying out nets and trapping fish, yet little did he realize that Satan had set a snare for him. The Satan was fishing for him with tantalizing and sinister desires, lures that captivated him like a, like a moth to a flame. Satan sat back and watched as this man destroyed his life. He plunged his life into ruin, destruction. He lost 11 years of his life in a prison. That's why it says piercing themselves with many griefs. And I'm sure that that was not an enjoyable time that he spent there. Now while this example is true and is a very real circumstance or a very real um, a very real <laughs> trying to think of a word here but I'm, I, I just uh, <laughs> forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, <laughs> there are all kind of consequence. Wow. <laughs> a very real consequence. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry about that. Very real consequence. There are worse things than going to jail for, even for 11 years that happen every day as a result of giving in to greed, giving in to lust, giving in to temptation, all kinds of sins. But I, I wanted to bring this, uh, this tragic story because 
I want, to, I want us to think about how does sin gain a foothold in the first place? How does it find that place in our hearts where we, we cave into that temptation and we give in? You know, Satan knows our weaknesses, doesn't he? He uses snares and traps as an attempt to, uh, to entrap us, doesn't he? Um, this sin we become addicted to, it starts to build up. And it starts to develop into consequences. It fills us with darkness, slowly taking over our inner being. If you think about this fisherman when he was like, oh, fifty to sixty thousand dollars a night, how many times do you think he caught, got got away with it? You know, he just kept getting more and more sloppy and more and more greedy all the time until finally, at the uh, at the end point of it, he was so sloppy that he got caught. And you know. I used to be a, a fraud investigator for uh, public assistance, as you know, and sometimes we wouldn't catch people right away. Sometimes they'd get away with it, but they would keep doing it. They couldn't stop. They were never satisfied with getting a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand dollars, but they kept doing it. And you know, one time they make a mistake and you catch them, and then the consequences, they all add up. One of the cases that I remember working on was this lady that had done it for, I think, 13 years. 13 years. And when she finally was caught, it wasn't one year that she was facing of uh, consequences. It was 13 years of consequences that had stacked up and piled up into a much more significant um, criminal charge. And it wasn't only me. I actually had partnered with the... Uh, with Social Security Administration, and they had special agents that investigated this woman. Housing and Urban Development, they had also had special agents that investigated this woman. So two federal agencies and the state of New Hampshire all coming down on this lady all at the same time because it kept piling higher and higher and higher and the consequences got more and more and more. And she got away with it for a long time. People couldn't prove it. But she made a mistake. And then when people really started digging into things, it was like pulling on the little string on the bottom of a sweater. The whole thing came undone. That's how it was for this guy, too. You know, he got away with a few strips here and there, but he got sloppy, and eventually they caught him. Because sin always has consequences. And even if those consequences aren't realized in this world, they are realized in the next one. But anyway, enough about that. It gains a foothold. It takes us over. It causes us eventually to do things that can be pretty horrible. Um, and if we think about um, the Pharisees, that's something that was happening to them too, right? Matthew 23, 25 through 26 it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup. So they make the outside appearance, everything look good on the outside, so nobody would ever suspect them of the evil that was, that was deep inside, right? But the inside, they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside may be clean also. You know, we, I think we as Christians have to be careful of this one because sometimes we can get a little self-righteous or a little high on our, on our horse, think that we're being really great and pretending to be righteous, right? Because that's what the Pharisees were doing, right? They were extorting people. They were dragging people into courts. They were, they were beating people. They were doing all kinds of horrible, mean, terrible things, but on the outside, they looked really good. And that's what Jesus was saying. You know, you guys look like you're all righteous. You're doing all the right things. You look like you're God's chosen people. But when you really take a look at your insides, it's nasty in there. And I think that's something that we have to be careful for ourselves. And you say, well, Jesus was talking about these Pharisees in this particular instance. And you might say, well, I was, I was baptized. So there, you know, I'm all set. I'm saved. I've been forgiven of my sins. 
And while that's true, that a good confession in Jesus Christ followed by baptism will forgive sin, it isn't the end of sin. It isn't the end of the struggle. It's the beginning. Because you see, God has taken you from Satan, but Satan wants you back. And he wants you to choose him over God. I'm going to bring you to a rather peculiar, weird passage, something that I kind of thought was a, an interesting passage, but I think it has a lot to tell us about the way evil works inside of us. It's a passage from Matthew uh, 12, 43 through 45. It talks about demon possession. Um, it's making a greater point about sin and the condition of sin and whom it affects. But it's put in kind of a strange way, and I'm going to... I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It says, Matthew 12, 43 through 45, Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. So waterless place, you might have desert in your translation or dry lands or whatever. But anyway, it's basically a desert. So waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, and this is interesting, swept and put in order. Interesting. Just think about that for a minute. It comes back, he finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself. And if you thought there might be levels of demons, like even worse ones, here is your, here's your proof for that. And they go in and they live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So he, he was possessed by that demon, but now he's got eight of them, right? That is the way it will be also with this evil generation. So that's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees about these people, these whitewashed tombs, these pretty on the outside, but dirty on the inside. So what exactly is going on here in this passage? Why? What's he saying this for? Well, first we'll, we'll address quickly demons. Uh, and what Jesus is telling us about demons is that they restlessly drift through the desert. And if you might remember the, uh, when he, when he uh, cured the demoniac that had legion, they said, don't cast us out into basically the desert, to nowhere. Please put us in those pigs. So they don't like doing that for some reason. But there they are, drifting out in the desert. So next time you move to Arizona, <laughs> think about that. <laughs> But they were known to travel in the desert and in graveyards and in old ruins. So these are, these are things that are um, verified actually in places in scripture and from other texts, uh, Jewish texts actually that, relate to the, that are related to the Bible and such. But anyway, they're out there looking for someone to take advantage of. And this particular demon to which Jesus refers is in search of rest. So he wants to rest in someone's soul or inside someone. And when he cannot find rest in the desert, he decides to go back where he was cast out from in the first place. He was ejected. Get out of here. Leave. But he goes back thinking, well, maybe now I can, I can move back in. Right? And, there, and make a home there again. And what Jesus is saying is that the people of Israel... They were God's chosen people, weren't they? They were made clean by God, right? It finds it, the demon, it finds it swept and put in order. Everything in its place. It's clean in there. It's a nice place to be, right? Everything clean and put in order. Everything as it should be, except for one thing. It's unoccupied and ready to receive a recipient, right? Basically, this is every teen angst movie ever told. Right? You ever see those angsty teen movies uh, when, in the 80s? Um, the home is in per perfect order and the parents leave. And then, and then the teen calls their buddies over to have a party while the parents are gone. And then what happens to the house? It gets totally destroyed, right? They have this crazy, lust-fueled party and totally destroy the house. And they wake up the next day from this drunken haze and, and the house is obliterated. Right? And that's, that's what's going on here. Because it was clean, everything was put in order, everything in its place. And that demon moves back in and he says, you know what, I'm going to take not only myself, but seven more of my even worse friends. And we're going to totally destroy this place. And this is your soul. 
that Jesus is talking about. Your soul. Just think about that for a minute. How profound that is. How scary that is. <clears throat> and I think, you know, all that they would do is leave destruction and chaos, obviously. Ba Jesus was basically saying that Israel was that angsty teen that was waiting for their dad to look the other way so that they could have all these bad kids move in and have a big party. You know, I think a lot of people have that audit attitude towards God. We are cleansed and made right by God through Jesus' sacrifice, the sacrifice that he made for us. We're, we're cleaned out, we're washed clean of our sins, everything straight, and put us, he put us back in order that God sweeps out the dirt and the cobwebs and all the dirty spots in us. He cleans us, he makes us fresh, he makes us new, and then we go right back to the way that we were. And what's more than that, that some of us go back so far that we are worse than we started out at. That we become even worse than we were in the first place. Not only does that demon return, that demon of sin that has been holding us back, but it calls its, eight, its seven buddies. And now we have so much more that we're struggling this, with this. And you know, when you think about letting sin back in your life and how destructive it is, do you think you're ever going to come out right on the other side? Do you think that the demons, when they're done, are going to leave things nice and tidy and clean and perfect? And be like, you know what, we had some fun here, but we're, gonna, we're just going to move on now. <laughs> no, that's not how it works in life, is it? Things just get worse. They just spin until we change. They just go down the drain. They just keep getting worse. Sin keeps getting a bigger and a bigger foothold. It takes more and more of our life all the time. It occupies our minds and our thoughts more all the time. It doesn't let go. It just demands more. It asks for more. And you might say, well, you know, this is talking about the Jews that had not obeyed Christ, the Pharisees that were hypocrites. This isn't talking about people in the Christian age. This isn't talking about me. Well, I think that there's a verse here that, that would address that as well. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. What's he saying? He's saying that this is applicable to you too. That, you know, the things that people struggle with, the sins, the demons, the temptations, the desires, those things are not gone. And just because you came to Christ at one point in your life, if you aren't continuously dedicating yourself to him, if you aren't continuously focusing on his word, if you aren't making him the, the primary part of your life, then you're going to have this empty room. You're going to have a vacancy. You're going to have an available place for sin to gain a foothold, to get in the door. You know, this, this passage here follows um, a bunch of other scriptures and teachings by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about all the ways in which Israel failed. All the bad and evil and terrible things that they did. And then all the consequences that came as a result of them not following God's commands. So because they did not live righteously, because they continued to live in sin, because they would not learn from their ways, they became increasingly more evil. And they, and they paid for that. They paid for that sin. And then Paul comes and says here, these things happened to them as an example and were written for our instruction. Don't do the things that they did. That's what he's saying, right? These things happened to them. Don't let them happen to you. That's what he's saying, right? The goal then is once Jesus has put your life in order, once Jesus has cleaned your room and made it a warm and welcoming place. It is time for yourself to get some new tenants, right? You don't want the old ones back. That way when the demons come from the past and they come looking for a refuge, they'll see a sign up on the door that says no vacancy, right? 
So how do, how do you do that exactly? Well, I think that there's a lot of ways that are written in the Bible, and I'm going to take a look at one right here. And I, I think looking at the life of Barnabas is a good way to start. If you look at Acts 11, 22 through 24, it says, The news about them reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that Barnabas was an encourager. Well, you know, from Acts 4.36, we know that Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. Uh, so... Can you imagine that you are so well known for a virtue, a fruit of the Spirit, such a wonderful attitude that people give you that as a nickname? You know, people just call you Compassion. <laughs> that's your nickname, that's Compassion over there. Why is he called Compassion? Because that's what he is, he's a compassionate guy. Well, that was Barnabas, right? He was an encourager, so they just called him Son of Encouragement. And that's, that's the way we have to be known by the fruit of the Spirit. That has to be who we are. That has to, you know, the, the love, the, the righteousness that comes from God, those should all be how we're known. That should be what occupies that room, that, that empty place that God has made nice and clean and fresh and new for us to occupy with good works, with good things, not, to, not as a place for the demons to come back to and have a crazy party, right? <clears throat> what Barnabas tells us about our life is that we need to drive out sin and be like Barnabas. We need to let in love. We need to let in goodness and righteousness. We have to fill ourselves up with the Holy Spirit of God. That way, we're not going to be affected by that sin any longer. And as we leave here today and we go out into the world, let us not forget where our heart belongs. Let us not be like the fisherman who was tempted by greed or like that angsty teen waiting for a crazy party when their parents turn their backs and so desecrate the house that God has made so holy. Rather than that, let us be filled with the righteousness that comes from God, with the Holy Spirit. Let us make Jesus our guide and follow in the footsteps of good men, encouragers like Barnabas, full of faith. Let us take time each day and pray and think about how we might be a light in this world, how we might serve the Lord better. And when we think about how that's possible, to go out and do it, to, to grab that bull by the horns, fear or nothing, just go right ahead and be a good person. Don't be afraid to be a good person. Sometimes it is a scary thing to do the right thing. But we're always better for it. I think we're always better for stepping up and doing the right thing. Even when it's hard. And if you're here today and you haven't given your life to the Lord, I would encourage you to think about what life could, with God could be. Do you want the love that comes from God, the peace of mind that comes from him? Do you want a real hope for your future? A hope that comes with the promise of forgiveness and forgiveness that leads to everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins, and what does repent mean? That means to give up on that sin and not go back to it anymore, to turn away from it. And then you're baptized. Then you receive the grace of God and the forgiveness of sin. You receive the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a promise for eternal life. If this is something that you would seek, or if this is something that you want today, then I encourage you to come forward as we stand and we sing our closing song. We'll work till Jesus comes.